Wait, wait, one more. There we go. That's my name. <clears throat> uh, okay. Are there any Blackfeet in the audience? All of you are better than everybody else here. <laughs> I had some people, uh, some of the writers that were worried, and they said, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I belong here. And I said, you don't. I say you don't, but neither, neither, you know, Louise, she doesn't belong here either. The only people that belong here are Blackfeet. That's what you need to know. <laughs> I was gonna get, I was gonna get up here and, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, Blackfoot Land, but I, I didn't think I'd make it out of the theater. <laughs> So I'll try to make this short. S said no black feet ever. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, uh, but I, I will, because all of you are going to have to hear me talk about 77 times in the next three days. Uh, I'm really happy everybody's here. Uh, I'm really proud of what we put together. Um, you know, I want to really quickly thank everybody that worked uh, on the organizing committee with me over the last year and a half. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this on Saturday night. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we've got Lois Welch, obviously, uh, you know, without whose blessing this festival wouldn't be happening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we've got Kim Anderson, who's just a, uh, who ran the... <laughs> you got to... If you're gonna, this is really easy. I don't even have to say anything. I just say somebody's name and I, and I hear a clap. No, Kim ran the Mozilla Book Festival for uh, I think 15 years. And um, you know, obviously I've never done anything like this before and uh, we could not have done this without her expertise. Uh, Ryan Lenz, who, uh, you know, a good friend of mine that I met when I was in the Iowa program, he's um, done an extraordinary number of things. He put the website together, he did the social media. I uh, took care of all the riders and their, their plane tickets and, uh, and basically, uh, you know, listened to me uh, uh, like collapse uh, over and over for the last six months. So um, I, I, I like to refer to him as the hand of the king. I'm going to keep using that. I've, there are people here who have already heard that joke like five times. I'm going to keep saying it. I don't care whether or not you laugh. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'm a good friend of April Cipher, uh, Adrian Jawart, Heather Cahoon, uh, and Chris Latre, you know, who helped us uh, for the first year until it got too difficult for him to work with me because he's not Blackfeet. Um, uh, we've, been working, uh, we've been working really hard to make this happen. Um, and if any of you, uh, you know, saw us running around Missoula in the last couple days uh, like we were on meth, uh, that wasn't meth. We were just trying to get everything done. Maybe it was meth. I don't know. Uh, a couple of things before we bring uh, Arlene up here. You know, I want to uh, dedicate uh, tonight's event to Simone uh, Odessa Little Plume, who we lost last weekend. Uh, she was in our uh, in our lang in our language a uh, uh, which translates as a wavering woman. Uh, in English, you would call her uh, trans or LGBTQ, uh, but we have other ways of, of talking about our own. Uh, she was one of those Indians who was very close to their grandparents. <clears throat> had a lot of stories. And, uh, and you know, it's impossible to explain how important these people are in our communities. A, uh, a couple of things about, uh, um, a couple other things here. We've got an info table back there, as some of you probably noticed. Uh, you can ask anything back there. I mean, if you want, like, like I used to, you know, I used to be a tour guide in Glacier Park. And my fa uh, every, every summer, somebody would, you know, we'd be driving through the mountains and somebody would say, how much, uh, how much do you think that mountain weighs over there? And <laughs> Uh, and we have, we have the very best people at our info table, and you can ask them that question, they will have an answer for you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's also a donation table back there. Um, all of the 80% uh, uh, of the donations uh, go to me. I will... Uh, <laughs> I'm really hungry. I need to go to Arby's after this is over with. Uh, 
but uh, but actually all uh, all of the donations are going to go toward the next festival that we're going to hold in the summer of 2024. Um, and uh, and also uh, just because this is some this is something that all of us want to do, we're going to we're going to be starting the uh, the James Welch uh, reading series. Uh, we don't have a date for that yet, but I'm hoping that we can do it late fall this year. And uh, you know, as some of you know, we had a, a Native Comedy Night uh, fundraiser last Friday at the Zac, uh, which is over there. No, yeah, right over there. And. Uh, uh, that went really well, and that was really cool. I, I loved seeing all those comedians up there, and uh, and they were all really excited about it. There's the, one of the main reasons this festival exists, and you're going to hear me say this again on Saturday. Is it's very hard. It's very hard for us to. Uh, uh, it's very hard for Native uh, artists to uh, have a space uh, where we feel like we can talk the way we want to talk, and you know, and do the things we want to do. And th and that's one of our. That's one of the main reasons. Uh, one of the main things driving this festival is to create that kind of space. And, uh, and that Native Comedy Night was part of that. And so um, we're also gonna be starting the James Welch uh, Native Comedy Night uh, series, and I'm hoping that we can run that twice a year, and that would also be here in Missoula. And so all of your donations uh, will be going toward the next festival and the reading series uh, and helping to uh, bring in these you know, incredible writers that are here and, uh, um, and, the, and the comedy night. Because uh, I, I really want, I really want everybody that that we bring in here to leave here feeling appreciated. That's really important to me. And, uh, and so, any of your donations, any donations you make, are going, uh, you know, toward that uh, appreciation. A um, couple other things here. There's going to be a Q and A after after all the main after all the main talks uh, here at the Wilma uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday night. The way we're going to do the Q and A. Uh, is there is you know uh, the, the info table back there and there are cards at that info table and if you have questions we want you to fill out that card and leave it with the people at the info table put your question on the card I'm telling you right now don't if anybody put gives them a card that say that says what is it like to be an Indian we're kicking you out of here um, <clears throat> <laughs> I, that's that's why we're doing this, so we don't have to answer those kinds of questions. But, but if you, <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to ask a question, though, uh, we would love to have you do that. We're gonna have you fill out info ca uh, cards at the info table. Those cards are gonna come to me, and I'm gonna ask the questions at the mic back there. Okay. Um, other thing, there there are some uh, young adult and children's books back there. Those were donated by Hope a Mountain. That's a nonprofit uh, that invests in rural. Uh, and tribal citizen leaders who are improving education. Um, my, oh, I'm sorry, Shelby, my notes are terrible here. Ecological health and economic development. Um, and those, uh, I don't know, those books are free. There's something else I wrote there, but I can't understand it. The books, the books are free anyway, so uh, you should uh, take some. Uh, let's see, we're also gonna be having, um, we don't have those, these books yet, but we will have them tomorrow night and Saturday night at the uh, at the Fact and Fiction book table back there. Uh, we have we're going to have uh, a bunch of copies of Louise's most recent book, uh, The Sentence, and those books will be uh, you can take those. They will be signed. We hope, Louise, please. <laughs> uh, they're going to have those books signed, and those will be free. Or you can or you can uh, um, give whatever kind of donation you feel like giving. And obviously, those those donations will go to the. Uh, to Arby's. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm, so we're going to start this. Uh, we're just. I'm just going to keep saying we're going to start, and then I'll they'll say more. And then, well, we're going to start this now. Uh, we're going to bring up Arlene uh, Adams here in a second. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about her. She's going to be doing our uh, opening prayer, and I believe she's going to uh, do a, a song also. Uh, it was important to me that we have um, uh, that we have uh, somebody who's Salish here to do that uh, because we are, you know, everybody knows where we are. Uh, so just a, a quick word, <laughs> I'm, you know, <laughs> wait, wait, where are we? <laughs> We're on Salish land. <laughs> um, uh, although there are Blackfeet. <laughs> If you talk to them, they're like, oh, we've always been here. Uh, when I went, when I gave a talk at I a couple of years ago, that's how I was all the way down in, you know, Santa Fe, and I said, I just want to welcome all of you to Blackfoot Land. <laughs> Every, it's like it's like that, you know, that all oh, that thing, like wherever you go, you know, there you are. 
But, but for us, it's wherever, you, wherever we go, that's our land. <laughs> We're the original white people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, now for Arlene. Uh, Thunder Sparks, also known as Arlene Adams, is Bitterroot Salish and a descendant of Grizzly Bear Tracks, the Salish leader. The Higgins Street Bridge is being named after. It's this bridge right here. She was one of the first three graduates of the University of Montana's Native American Studies program in 1997. She currently lives in Arlene, Montana, as an, and is employed at Two Eagle River School as a Salish and Kootenai uh, cultural advisor. Um, <clears throat> I, man, I, I, won't, I was going to tell another Blackfeet joke, but I'll stop. I'll, 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 I mean, it just means I tell an extra one tomorrow. Um, also, I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but like when, when Arlene is done, don't clap. That's not how this works, okay? It's not an entertainment. Uh, now, uh, Arlene Adams. Hola. The Salish and Kootenai people in the room? Yep, in Kwesiakwe Steel Sterling, eh? <laughs> I'm going to talk English first and say what an honor and privilege it is to be amongst all you celebrity writers. Without you, I couldn't have got through college. So thank you, Lemlemch Husukitlkukne. It's um, your words that kept me motivated your words that filled my heart, and your words that kept my feet going. So lemlemsh. If I could ask you all to stand, and they told me that it's a diagonal towards east. If you would face east. I'm going to sing a song, a prayer song from Salish country when our people re were removed from the Bitterroot. The way my dad explains it is that um, this is our, our stronghold to our land. And so you need to know that we're standing on Salish land. So lemlemch kulin sutin husukit kukini atzmet kapapawasiyat nausan miedki
Lemlemch, who's so good cooking. Lemlemch to my family that's here tonight and my grandkids for standing behind me. And for the animals that dress me up, comes from our land, keeps me going, and holds me up. And so to all you people, Lemlemch, who's so good cooking. Thank you. I'm already back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to introduce Lois now. Uh, Lois is, as you know, is um, you know Jim's uh, widow, and uh, one of the one of the privileges of uh, organizing this. Uh, festival with her has been that I've I've been able to hear a lot of stories about Jim, and has, that's meant a lot to me. Um, I just I like hearing them. Well, Lois uh, was born and raised in Salem, Oregon. She's the daughter of a biology professor. <clears throat> Before going to France as a oh man, I think I I think I misspelled this, Lois. It either, it's <laughs> This either says this is either supposed to say conversation assistant or conversion assistant. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, doesn't matter. You're, none of you're going to remember it in five minutes anyway. Um, uh, assistant with her BA from Willamette University. She worked uh, before that. She worked in strawberry fields and canneries. After she earned a doctorate in comparative literature at Occidental College, Lois taught at Portland State College for four years and then in 1966 joined the faculty of the University of Montana English Department. She taught drama, literary theory, and in 1973 UM's first course in women's literature. In 1967 she met a poet in the UM graduate creative writing program. His name was James Welch and he was studying under the legendary teacher Richard Hugo. Lois and Jim married in 1968, uh, thus beginning what she describes as a lovely literary odyssey. During her academic career, she published critical articles on Aristotle, Dostoevsky, Eudora Welty, and comedy. Uh, Jim first published poetry, and then in 1974, Jim's first novel, Winter in the Blood. Has anybody ever heard of that book in here? I won't say anything. Uh, uh, Winter in the Blood was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review, and he became part of what is now commonly known as the Native American literary renaissance, otherwise, uh, or the first period in history when, when Indian authors gained literary prominence in America. The term was coined by the American academic Kenneth Lincoln in 1983 uh, in his book by the same name. Lois often accompanied Jim on his reading tours to workshops like the Port Townsend Writers Conference and especially on trips to France and Italy. I mean, I would have gone especially to France and Italy too. Uh, sometimes giving talks herself. During her 35 years at the University of Montana, she brought in 102 of America's best writers for readings and residencies. She directed the creative writing program from 1987 to 1994. She retired in 2001, having served three years as chair of the English department. Jim died in 2003. Lois lives in Missoula and is working on what she refers to as her gymoire, uh, a memoir of their life together. It is my privilege to uh, introduce Lois Welch to all of you. Hello. It's been a long time since I've had this microphone. It's wonderful. <laughs> Welcome to the inaugural reading of the inaugural James Welch Native Lit Festival. I couldn't be more thrilled. 
Every molecule in my body is currently thrilled to be here with Louise Erdrich and Sterling Holy White Mountain and all of you in this wonderful theater celebrating Jim and native writers, some of whom I know and some of whom I have yet to meet. I want, by the way, to say that out there somewhere is my sister and my nephew. I won't ask you to stand because I won't be able to see you if you do. <laughs> and also my nephew Bill Welch and his wife Michelle are out there somewhere. Jim's younger brother Tim was hoping to come but a medical problem has prevented him from it. It will be in one week 19 years since Jim left us. He never dreamed of such a wonderful event as this festival is turning out to be. He would have been startled and embarrassed to find out it was honoring him, but he would have been pleased. He would have smiled. He always smiled. In 1985, when I was in charge of the UM English Department lecture series, one bleak afternoon in the winter, I opened my office door to find a, a delegation of graduate students proposing to kneel right there in the hallway unless I called Louise Erdrich right then to give a reading. So impressed were they by the novel Lo Love Medicine, which has been published the previous year. Louise accepted. So 36 years and three weeks ago, on June 7th, 1986, Louise Erdrich gave a reading in Missoula. She had driven with her then husband and at least some of their six children to see the Rocky Mountains and then read at the University of Montana from that first novel. I introduced Louise that night and so insisted that I get to do it tonight. Last Tuesday, this very last Tuesday, a cassette tape appeared in one of those back corners in my house where you put things you're supposed to throw out but can't quite bear to. It was a reading, it was a cassette recording of Louise's 1986 reading. She was still awestruck from seeing her first mountains in Glacier. I understand they don't have any of those in Minnesota. <laughs> she read Night Sky from her book of poems, Jack Light, then read a long section from Love Medicine. Everyone loved it, everyone loved her, and no one since has offered to kneel in the halls in order to get their favorite writer to come. <laughs> in those 36 intervening years, Louise has become, and I quote, a revered cultural treasure, complete with a Pulitzer Prize from 2019 for the novel about her maternal grandfather, The Night Watchman. The Pulitzers are real cool. My Jim, my Jim, predicted no Indian would ever again win one after Scott Momaday won it in 1969 for House Made of Dawn. Louise won that Pulitzer after winning every other literary prize in the country, some of them twice. She must have an entire wall covered with plaques. That's Q-U-E. <laughs> Louise has, if my count is correct, published 27 other books since 1984. Beat Queen, Tracks, Bingo Palace, Tales of Burning Love, Antelope Wife, The Last Report on the Mir Miracles at Little no, Hor no Horse, Grandmother's Pigeon, and so on. In her latest book, The Sentences, 
It, it haunt us, haunts me as it should. Never mind the revered cultural treasure stuff. That's a lot of serious writing. Roughly one book every 15 months. Readers love her characters, her plots, her humor, her prose, and the way her characters grapple with the big issues of life, death, and dispossession. I read somewhere that Louise liked to read in her chair, liked to write in her chair, longhand, with her children running about. I can't imagine that, but clearly it works. <laughs> it probably doesn't help at breakfast to know that you're a revered cultural treasure. <laughs> it may even give you indigestion. <laughs> what can you do after breakfast? Let your neighbor touch the hem of your t-shirt. <laughs> when you sit down to write, it's still ink, paper, and words. I would like to propose that Louise Erdrich is, for this audience, a shining exemplar of the possibility of achievements for writers. I tend to think of Jim and Louise as contemporaries, and they did know each other. But she's 14 years younger. Consequently, he was the one <clears throat> who received a letter in May 1984 from her editor at Holt Reinhardt, asking him to blurb the forthcoming love medicine. Her editor was good called the book Iridescent with Magic. Have you read an iridescent book lately? <laughs> iridescent with Magic, stark and surprising and wryly funny, then laid out the plot using the word authenticity only once. That's rare for Indians. <laughs> she went on, the editor went on, that is. An endorsement from you, Jim, would be invaluable in drawing attention to this work, which I am convinced marks the beginning of an extraordinary writing career. And right she was. Jim didn't write that blurb because he was deeply involved in finishing his own novel, Fool's Crow, in 1984, and grieving the death of our dear friend, Matthew Hansen, the poet Richard Hugo's stepson. Jim only read the novel after she came to Missoula in 86 and read many more of hers as they appears. Louise, on the other hand, wrote an extraordinary introduction to the 2008 Penguin edition of Winter in the Blood. I say extraordinary because it begins with this sentence. In 1974, no fiction award was given for the Pulitzer Prize, but it should have been given to the book you are holding. Winter in the Blood was, she goes on, was and still is a central and inspiring text to a generation of Western, regional, and Native American writers, including me. More than that, Winter in the Blood is a quiet American masterpiece, that it was overlooked for the prestigious prizes of that year, only speaks of its visionary simplicity and the real depth of the heart that wrote it. Neither Jim nor I ever allowed ourselves the audacity even to imagine that first sentence might be true. It is true that landing on the front page of the New York Times Book Review in November 74 launched Jim's career. But one can only dare to dream so much. Pulitzer? No. Nah. Nobel? Well, maybe later. <laughs> I often, when Jim, I was to take over phone duty when Jim was writing, and he said, don't call me unless it's the Nobel people. It took the gutsy, clear-eyed Louise to articulate the shape of that particular cultural mom moment. 
I want to close by reading Louise's conclusion to her wonderful introduction, because it says as much about her as it does about Jim. And tonight, we are celebrating both of them. She says, I wanted to write the introduction to this book because Winter in the Blood was a touchstone for me when I began to write. I was living far from the Great Plains, but as I am from North Dakota and part Turtle Mountain Chippewa, I could see and feel everything that happened on every page of Winter in the Blood. I first read this book many times, not to find the secret of the writing, but to go home. I knew what the title meant. I found comfort in this book. Even in the bar scene, there was for me a great solace of affinity. I thought the book had a great sense of the absurd and admired Welsh's precise and funny way of looking at people. The first book to help me understand that I came from a place, this first book, excuse me, helped me to understand that I came from a place I was supposed to write about. Reading the book now, I learned even more about good writing and the resonance of simplicity. What astonished me after a time, she continued, was that something so familiar could be made into literature. Welch had done something nobody else had, written about Indians without once getting pious, uplifting, or make, making you feel sorry for the plight. This is heady praise. I so wish that Jim could have read that, that I nearly burnt a copy to ashes to sprinkle on his grave so he could read it. When I worry that people have forgotten or don't appreciate Jim, I reread Louise's introduction to Winter in the Blood. I may have thanked her on paper. I wish to, thank, I wish to repeat my profound thanks in this friendly room. She is, on the other hand, keeping on publishing wonderful books. I want you to think of this. The Wikipedia article about Louise stated that as a child, her father paid her a nickel for every story she wrote. Think about that. My father, a biologist, offered me at age five a nickel for every time I cleared our lawn of dandelion blossoms. <laughs> a few square feet of picking taught me my most profound lesson in cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> my advice would be, pay your kids a quarter for every story they write, Keep a jar full of quarters nearby, alongside a growing stack of engrossing books by Louise Erdrich. Please join me now in welcoming Louise Erdrich herself, that cultural treasure. Lights. I just want to see everybody. Hello. Bonjour. I mean, I I can see a lot of you people. Um, hello, relatives. Hello, my relatives. Uh, going to just sit a minute with that introduction, with that prayer with Sterling. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to put this down here and then every time I lean over, um, somebody can take a drink of whatever you have to. 
<clears throat> it's not a drinking game, but <laughs> here we go. Um, I'm a little off guard, caught off by that introduction. I really, I'm so moved. Um, <clears throat> so again, thank you. Um, thank you, Lois. Thank you, everybody who's here. Thank you, Salish Kootenai. Thank you, Blackfeet, and all Anishinaabeg. If you're, uh, besides being Ojibwe or Chippewa, if you're Anishinaabe, um, you're native, so that's cool. Is there, are there any other Anishinaabe in the room? That includes Dene, that includes everybody. And um, oh, thank you, tribal research specialists. Does anybody know who they are? Yes, are there any tribal research specialists here? No, of course not. This is a podcast. I follow it, and it is terrific. It's very funny. And if you get a hold of any of those guys, tell them, why weren't you here? <laughs> Thank you, fact and fiction. <laughs> Mara. Thank you. It's a great bookstore. My daughter. Ira, a.k.a. Gij, and I are here together, and we were in it today. Um, we bought, oh, I left it on my bag back there, but the, we bought a copy of, of Perma Red. That book is out. It should have been out forever. It's out again now, and it's gorgeous. So thank you to Deborah Magpie Erling. It's an amazing book. It's got a snake on the cover. You can't not buy a book like that. Hot red with a snake on the cover. It's gorgeous. Uh, let's see. Um, and then, um, so how I came to be here. It, it has to do with Sterling, like so many things do. Um, so Sterling uh, called me to do a, an interview in Minneapolis. And I was in Minneapolis, and he was out, I think, first, first he was in California, yeah, and then he was in a car somewhere. And then I, uh, I know he was in the car, and he was driving toward Minneapolis. And then he texted me somewhere and said, you know, the car is having trouble. I'm like, okay. And he texts me again, ah, uh, now the car's really having trouble. So, okay. Then I get this text, um, well, it's only going 40 miles an hour. And he's not even to North Dakota yet. <laughs> so I get these texts, I'm going 40 miles an hour through North Dakota. 40 miles an hour, still, so like a week later, <laughs> 40 miles an hour, <laughs> finally he gets to, finally he gets there and, and we, had, we had a wonderful conversation. And um, then this came up, talking here. And to me, it sounded like a great idea, just perfect idea. And um, so here I am. And I'm here, happy to see you all, but I'm here because I owe a lot to James Welch. When I started, uh, when I met Lois again here, I told her that I was gonna talk about Jim Welch, mostly. Well, actually I was only gonna talk about Jim, and she looked a little alarmed, honestly. <laughs> so I do have, uh, an, uh, one of my books here, too, in case I run out of things to say about Jim. Uh, and then there's also questions. And if there was a title, we're going to go back to the Pulitzer. It's about what I learned from Jim Welch 
and why he still should be awarded the 1974 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. So I'm just starting this. You know, everybody who um, is in this venue, this room, this wonderful Wilma, can write a letter to somebody else or, or, or text or email, whatever you, you want to do, and, and start this rolling because this prize never was awarded, right? It still can be, and I'll explain why it was never awarded. So let's start it going. Yeah. Even though I met uh, James Welch only a couple of times, we didn't really know one another, but we did because of writing. But every, when I did meet him, he, the last time was uh, at my bookstore, our bookstore in Minneapolis called Birchbark Books, which is mostly devoted to native writing. Um, Jim came there and struck me. I, I, was, I was a little bit in awe. Um, and I was very pregnant with my, my buddy here, Ira. <laughs> anyway, um, he's so modest and so kind, so easy to talk to if I weren't so shy, easy to talk to. He signed um, a book, he signed the Heart Song of Charging Elk for me, so I still have this wonderful hardcover that's signed. And he also signed the back wall of our bookstore because we had um, writers sign the wall all the time. And I noticed that people would kind of encroach on his signature sometimes. So I have this little bottle of whiteout, and I just wipe their names out. <laughs> so I want that signature. Anyway, modesty in a writer, you know, that's pretty rare. We all know that. It's pretty rare. And, um, and it's not the same as insecurity, because insecurity to me is, is, is a constant need for attention, and so comes off often as, as really uh, an outgoing person or whatever, but um, modesty is some time, it's close to humility, but um, I don't wanna really say it's that. But curiosity is really tied to modesty and humility, because I notice that people who are, who are, who are, are like that are, are always curious about um, other people. You know, they always ask a lot of questions. So I think that's something that James Welch and his writing taught me, is how important it is to have a natural sense of curiosity and to always cultivate throughout your life, to have that as a writer. And to have within your a kind of tool bag when you go to write something, that natural curiosity that has caused you to find out about a lot of ordinary things. So when a writer has this kind of quality, you know, you know they're in it for the long haul. And how you're perceived by others isn't nearly as crucial as your own questions and the demands of your next book. So Jim Welch's reservation, his, his, his reserved qualities, that those were qualities that gave him the ability to step aside and let his characters exist on the page free of judgment. That's also really tremendously important. His style was never forced or self-consciously artful or designed to impress a critic or a reader. So that's why I say he was in it for the long haul. And I wish that had been longer. And I wish he was here right now. He went from poetry to the classical transparency of Winter in the Blood, the death of Jim Loney. And then he went to um, what I think of as a kind of radicalism of the Indian lawyer. I think that's an incredibly interesting book where he quietly busted down and broke 
stereotypes of Indian failure and loss. But first, he had to write Fool's Crow. And every time I read Fool's Crow, I am more astonished by this book. It's an encounter more than a reading. You encounter this book. You're a little worried on page one because you start off reading um, those kinds of descriptive nouns that are used in a lot of flowery 18th century, 19th century prose about native people and in, in movies and all these, these, these um, nouns. And you think, oh, is he gonna be able to do this? And you think that you've read books about that time in the 19th century, that time after the Civil War, when um, there'd always, you know, the, the um, wars of extermination had, had uh, were, were culminating. You think you know what it was like, the Winchester repeating rifle, all of these things, but, but then reading this book, you find you do not, you have never read anything like it. There has never been a book written like this. And that these words that are sometimes two or three words long, which you recognize from so many, so many um, native, write, native languages as being often the descriptive nouns of, of, that are used for things that were brought by European people. You know, they'll, they'll be, um, Bebe Jagongaji for is um, Anishinaabe Moen for the horse, the one nailed being. So there will always be a special descriptive um, way of describing these things. And you think, how is he going to do it when he is going to have to write with these words coming at you again and again, right? But he does it. And he solves it immediately by sending his main character, White Man's Dog, on a hero's journey, on a, a journey that, that it's a quest, a quest book. He joins a raiding party seeking honor or the holy grail of horses and vengeance. And by the time white, man do, white man's dog sets out carrying these descriptive nouns, you've absorbed the language. Your feet in the ground in the everyday joys and dangers and pleasures of Welch's tribal world. And it's not, again, it's not a world you've ever been in. And he's pulling it off because of what, of, of what really teaches me so much in his work, and that is a total commitment to the work. So as writers, I mean, we can start something, artists start something, but in it, I've read so many times a book that starts so beautifully and so well but somewhere the commitment falters and somewhere the person loses the, the, the inner grip that that demands. He never did. This book is also, after this whirl of action, it's a book of immense stillness. And there's not only the life and death quiet of stealth in Indian, an enemy country, but there is this inner roiling quiet of a man who is trying to work out the riddles of his dreams. And you're with him in every single way he tries to work them out. And the skew of his desires. And that's the other thing about his book that I think is radical. Is that... Um, Native people are allowed to have desire and they don't have to die of it. You can, you can have love, you can have desire, you can have all these things. But in so many previous no novels previous to this, if you had some sort of transgression, if you had a transgressive emotion, you had to, you had to keel over, you had to die eventually. That quiet... There's the, there's the despairing quiet of a woman who is veering between mourning and hope. And there is the quiet of a man who has been mutilated by the enemy. And there's, a, there's the silence of his fingerless hands. 
It's a bold book. Every single character comes to life in this book, the innocent as well as the unforgivable. That's what I mean about repressing judgment. There's no forgiveness in this book. Nobody has to forgive anybody for what they did. That's a very Christian concept. And being forgiven is about, you know, living in a state of embarrassment. So I've never wanted to be forgiven. I don't think people really want to be forgiven in that way. What there is in the book is a community, a community, a tribe in which you're either in, you're accepted, or you're shunned or you can leave, or you can be part. But if you're part of the community, then you have to earn your way back in. It's not like you get forgiven. And I really love that. And I think that's something radical that maybe indigenous readers understand more because um, that's very much part of how we live, how people live. Throughout this book, Welch lets his characters just exist. As I said, free of judgment. They have to be themselves. But he allows them to show themselves. He doesn't ever tell you much about them. They'll reveal themselves by um, glancing up from a piece of beadwork. And there'll be like, that's, there's going to be, a, there's going to be love. You just know something's going to happen. Somebody slides away out of a scene and you'll know that guilt is eating away at them. Or he, white man's dog, compassionately shares a piece of meat with a wolverine. The reality of the dreams, taken for granted, not pushed up into some sort of melodramatic way, is part of this book as well. Just the pure acceptance of dreams, reality, cause and effect. And these small scenarios are written so large on the consciousness of the book. And I felt in reading that book, and I hope, every, now I hope I'm getting everybody to, who hasn't read it to read it or read it again, that the book itself is a kind of consciousness. And of course, as a writer, each of the characters is an aspect of, of ourselves. It was, they were aspects of Jim Welch. And then I felt he was both the dreamer and the dreamed, that somehow... This book dreamed him. I, it, it, it felt like that. It felt like it was um, outside of him. That's the best thing you can say about a book, really. In The Indian Lawyer, as I said, I really felt that this was a radical book because this Sylvester Yellowcalf is this fully realized individual who is um, adept at being a professional, he doesn't actually have this, you know, he's not torn between two worlds. He goes back and forth. He has some discomfort, right? But he's, he's existing in both worlds. He's able to do it. As we know, so many of, of us do, of, of, of Native people do. Um, and I felt that was pretty radical. You know, that was not something I'd seen in, in um, writing before, in, in native writing. This acceptance. He's a man touched with grace, ath athletically and intellectually. And he has a complicated love life. And he has his conflicts of conscience. And he tries to stay true to the ideals of his people as well as negotiate the challenges of simply being human. Simply being human in a complicated set of societies. He used his work on the Montana State Board of Pardons to invent dilemmas for Sylvester Yellowcalf. Out of a parole hearing, plot evolves and that's one of the things I really learned from James Welch, Welch early on. My own experience was important. And I don't just mean the experience of native life at home or conversations in bars, although there's nobody who 
does that like him? Or dusk on the great plains or the gravity of what our elders have endured? I mean work, which for me involved the experience of tedium. I was a Let's see, I started as a, I, hoeing sugar beets. I worked as a farm on the farms. I, I worked um, selling popcorn in a movie theater that was beautiful the way this one is. I um, was a lifeguard. I waited tables, waited tables, short order cooked, worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I did so many different things. Um, uh, I was even a blue light special at Kmart. <laughs> I was drawing portraits of people. I, I did all these things, you know, and they're some of the most important things to a writer, those early jobs before you find your place as a writer. Because you can always go back to them, and you know from those jobs you're going to run into people who you'll never run into in your regular chosen set of friends type of life as a young person. You know, you're going to run into people that you really would never associate with and some that you're just lucky to, to find in life, you know. That's, that's real treasure and, and he taught me that. Um, so if you're listening to this as a writer and you have a job you love or better yet you hate, Congratulations, <laughs> and take notes. I also learned to read everything. Uh, one of the questions, oh wait, I gotta mention as an aside, I asked Lois right before this, what, what were some of um, Jim's jobs? And to my astonishment, she said he worked in a cemetery in Minneapolis. So that goes to show. Um, and I'm going to ask later about a lot of Jim's reading because he had, he read so so thoroughly. There was just each of the books is packed with this um, energy from other books, and I can tell when somebody who's writing a book and especially comes out in early novels if somebody has absorbed a lot of other books into it because you can feel the energy in the writing. Because as a writer, you don't just read a book for a plot and enjoy it, but you, you are omnivorous and you're hungry and you're reading in order to, to add to, the, to the, 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 the treasures that you can't even name. You can't even name the, when you're influenced by books. You can't even figure it out. You just have to keep reading and reading and reading, and I felt that in Jim's books. But most of all, I felt as though one of the big things I learned was to read history. As we think we go, grow up, particularly, I think, as indigenous writers, we think we know our history, but we really don't until we read everything that's written about our own personal history and until we ask everyone we know to tell us the histories and the stories and things we don't know. We don't know them. And, if, and, and, and for a, a non-native writer, it's the same way. You need to know your particular place in the world, your particular particular histories. You need to know everything. I don't think it's possible to write expansive fiction unless there's a basis for it in history, even if it's not overt, it's in there. And you can feel it. And in each one of Jim's books, the history is there, it's underlying, it's like some it's some layer of, of, of earth, it's the foundation, and then it becomes what you feared, usually, or what you longed for sometimes, the history, the real story. And for indigenous writers, too, 
writing our own histories is so important because people don't know. People don't know. It's not in textbooks. It's not in Native, course, Native American courses because th our histories are so widespread, so deeply unknown. There is so much that we can't, can't we, we can't really expect the rest of the world to know all there is to know about each one of our tribal histories. It's so complicated. But each person who writes about it can write, can dig down and bring some of it back. I think that's been the work of my life, is to find a way in, a lever of some kind, into our, my own tribal history and to unearth it, to wedge it out, and to put it into another person's hands in a way that's understandable and that's real and that's human and that can, can sink into another person. I think the hardest thing about writing indigenous history is the most obvious thing because it's hard to believe that when we see how deeply and earnestly our people serve the United States military, exist in the government, love our land, love our patriotic about our country, um, and, and, and truly in so many ways support, support our country. It's hard to know that only a couple of generations back for me, maybe it's more three or four for other people, um, the, the effort was um, stated, the stated effort was extermination. And even one of, some of our favorite writers like the writer of the Wizard of Oz wrote um, op-eds in the South Dakota Argus calling for the extermination of every man, woman, and child. Now, this is, these are truths. This is how it was. Um, and then came um, the proof that astonished people, that Native people could be educated. And then after that, beca it became um, extinction through assimilation in boarding schools. So these are our histories. But aside from that, there's this tremendous unknown wealth of story, of hilarity, of, of unbelievable love and tenacity and this affection, everyday affection between people. And that's what has always gotten everyone through. That's what got my ancestors, our ancestors through, through all of those things. So, oh yeah, I was gonna recommend something to people because I'm a recommender, I'm just warning you. So, if you're looking for history, your own history, tribal history, or any kind of history, look through, look down to Kansas City, Missouri, the Plains Archives there. And if you can't get down there, if you get there, the barbecue's amazing. <laughs> but if you can't get there, you can get online. And I did this with um, a, a librarian there. And you find out the librarian, go on the website, and talk to the librarian online, emails, and ask about your relatives, your great aunts, your great uncles, about people who um, went to boarding schools. And I promise you, it's going to surprise you. There is so much information. Everything that happened in boarding schools is in the Plains archives up to about 1954. And then after that, it's all in a, a salt mine, honest to God, down in Kansas. 
there are archives and records in salt mines. When I did this, it was part of the research for um, the Night Watchman. And I, I'm just going to say, you know, I think people imagine that um, Native writers just take their experience and put it on the page or something like that or something of that sort, but it, meticulous research goes into every book and especially into Jim's, Jim's books, certainly into my books. What I found out was that my grandfather, Patrick Gorno, who was later to use his eighth grade boarding school education to um, save, his, save uh, the Turtle Mountain Chippewa from termination, the only of the first five tribes slated for termination to successfully resist termination, and that was his, that was his um, life work. It was a short, heavy, difficult piece of life work. And I know that the Salish Kootenai, Kootenai, yeah, you guys had termination. And it was um, a book on termination that I, I read to, to help out with the book I was working on. Um, those books were deeply, deeply important, I think, because we don't have histories for each one of our uh, struggles, each one of our, our triumphs, each one of our difficulties. And it all, it all is related to, um, all those ones are related to government, but there's so many now that have to do with intricacies of tribal government, intricacies of education. There's, there's a multiplicity of, of work to be done. But still, being a writer means you have a life, you've given your life to, to giving words uh, to something deeper as well, as, his, as, as something inexpressible. It's true that you get to be your own person and make your own hours, but there's still laws. Welch was funny and ironic, but if he punched down, he always made his character come to terms with the shame of having done so. And I think, to me, that's one of the great themes in his work, is shame. Something we don't, we don't even want to talk about shame, but it's a great subject. He knew that as a writer, you're attempting to give a sense of what it means to suffer and to enter someone else's suffering is to enter a holy bond. You're tasked with loving and seeing and still loving all of humankind. You can write about the ridiculous, but you'll fail if you ridicule someone weaker. So always punch up. Welch did this well. Pom piercing a pompous bubble or bringing down a tyrant. The worst thing I think that a person could do in Welch's writing was to fail someone weaker. Children or elders or the incarcerated. And it takes a deep sympathy of mind to look upon that as your greatest failure in life. I mean, for a lot of heroes, it would be not doing something known as a macho thing, right? That would be the most embarrassing thing. But to, for, for Jim Welch, it would be, or have been, or for his characters, it was to fail someone weaker. And to, to write a truly kind character, you almost have to have that person fail sometimes because you don't come by kindness easily. And many times people are kindness when they have failed someone and they come to terms with that. And that's how we finally come to winter in the blood. So as we were saying, the Pulitzer Prize for Literature was not awarded in 1974. And this is the way it seems to work. One panel of judges for the Pulitzer selects two or three, or sometimes only one 
book for the final panel to approve. Maybe I've got this a little wrong, but that's how it seems to work. Anyway, in 1974, the final panel couldn't agree on the book they were told to award the prize to, and that was Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. How many people remember that book? Yeah. It's, a, it's really a pretty fine book, but I've never read it twice. You know, you wouldn't go back and read it twice. Whereas Winter the Blood, I don't know how many times I've read it. It doesn't resonate, it doesn't have what Winter in the Blood has. So with apologies to Thomas Pynchon, <laughs> Winter in the Blood is now judged the better book and should receive the prize. Because we talk about simplicity, simplicity is greatness. In music as in art, simplicity is the greatest aspect of art. Many of us um, started, um, thinks mm, contemporary literature started with Housemaid of Dawn, with Ceremony, which was, is by far the finest book ever written about uh, Native people and the military. But Winter in the Blood was the great American novel of those years. The 1970s was this era, I don't know, like people aren't gonna remember this, but it was the, the, the sort of Eastern, um, there really still is an Eastern establishment. It's still there. Um, it was riddle, you know, riddles, word games. It was, it was all these books that were too cool to have a plot and um, too cool to do anything but but um, entrance you with their cleverness, right? Winter in the Blood, lean, rich, poetic, funny, grim. As I said, it's not a show-off book, but it's so perfectly written that it really has to be read sentence by sentence, and I have tried to cut sentences from that book. You cannot do it. There's a kind of, um, it's a, almost a cloud, like a mythos around Winter in the Blood. There's something larger about that book. It's expressed without being explicit. And I think that he was able to give this ineffable sense of expansion because he stayed in the very moment. I mean, that book is right dead on every single moment. He stays in the absurd and sometimes degrading, um, sometimes ennobling actions of his character and allows his character to exist with this sense of history and to see the vastness of the world and the change of seasons here. When the leaves of the cottonwood changed to dusty gold and fell, the fields of alfalfa long since cut and baled turned black beneath a black sky that refused to rain. Mosquitoes appeared overnight as if by ma disappeared as if by magic and the blackbirds flocked up for their flight south. There's a beautiful description of first rays, our character's father making eggs black on the edges on a wood stove and frying butter, frying bread in butter that hissed a keen smell through the kitchen. This book turns on one acute, funny observation after the next. So, from Welsh, I also learned that to be alive is to be observant is to really look around you and, and observe. <clears throat> I've got it. <clears throat> and to know when to compress a scene and to draw it out, that's a real storyteller's gift. Here's my favorite passage from the beginning. The old lady imagined that the girl was Cree, an enemy, and plotted ways to slit her throat. One day, the flint striker would do. Another day, she favored the paring knife and kept, that she kept hidden in her legging. Day after day, those two sat across from each other until the pile of movie magazines spread halfway across the room, and the paring knife grew heavy in the old woman's eyes. 
Now what I love about that, the pleasure in that, is not only the paring knife growing heavy, that idea, but also, you know, originally for this lady, that knife would have been razor keen, it would have been a skinning knife, she, she would have really killed with that knife, but now it's just a paring knife. The Cree girl will run away, will, will run away, taking our character's gun and his electric shaver. Another thing to learn, objects resonate. And when you're reading um, a really good book, the objects will resonate and they'll appear later. They'll tell you things, they'll, they'll give, an, give a hint to action and plot. But, our, but we'll also learn in this book why heroes are inarticulate. We'll, we'll learn why people don't know what their feelings really are. We'll learn about why, why the character goes after uh, his electric shaver when he really wants love. But he goes on this quest, again, another quest. We'll learn about the frustration of betrayal, when his mother marries Lame Bull, and um, who take, this man takes over the ranch where her son has worked his life away and where his brother has died and is buried. And he sees, he sees this man, um, this, is, this is one of the most wonderful bubble pumping scenes he, sees, he just sees him every so often and he comments with a, a bit of irony on, oh, now he was talking about the great hardship it is to be an owner of, of a ranch, his responsibilities, when all along, that's his. He put his life into it, right? He's the son, but now Lame Bull has it. In the end, there's a funeral, and Welch tells us what everybody is wearing. You know, that's the great, that's the great kind of eye, eye there. That, what's everybody wearing? And he tells us, and then he says, the old lady's being buried, the grandmother. What is she wearing? An orange coffin with flecks of black and grain beneath the surface. Her eulogy, perfect in its utter ignorance. Her story, in the sacred memento that her grandson lowers into the grave. Sometimes I ask myself, where would James Welch have gone after Fool's Crow expanded his vision, Heart Song of Charging Elk, the extraordinary story of a man forced to play Indian in a Wild West show who is trapped in Marseille and makes his life there? Where would he go? And I guess that's for all of you young native writers to answer, right? There's a question that I know he would be asked because I'm often asked this question and um, I wanna thank James Welch for answering it for me. And that question is, is literature important Especially in these times, you know, these times. People are always, these times, these times. Is literature important? Is it? Is it enough? Literature is an encounter with another consciousness, and that's enough. Or it's a tale spun of consolations, and that's enough. Literature isn't politics. Yet, when an authoritarian despot seeks to rule, literature and poetry are the first things they get rid of. Every fascist regime imprisons writers. Why is this? It's because, I think, literature is strangely powerful in that it expresses the truth that we are more than chips in a program machine. We are more than masses of consumers to be manipulated. We are more than any ideology. We are more than bricks. The basis of literature is that we are both predictable and unpredictable. We are emotions, we are human, and to those who seek to control us, that is terrifying. Literature is crucial 
This is always my answer after reading any of the books James Welch wrote. Literature shows us who we are. More than that, it shows us who other people are. It allows us in to another person's thoughts and emotions. In that way, perhaps most for Native writers, literature is a kind of ceremony. Human-directed sacred events are attempts to address the mystery. Humanly witnessed sacred events are attempts to, direct, to address the mystery. And that's what we're here to do. It's all we can do, all we can humanly do, is to witness, love, and using art, address the mystery. Miumanik, Miigwech Ginoa. Thank you, James Welch. Thank you, Lois. Thank you all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mystery. Well, this is the next book, but I talked long, well over long enough. You, I've been up here. Um, I don't know if you still want to do questions or anything like that, but... We have really important questions for you, Louise. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Are you leaving? Okay. 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 Sterling. <clears throat> these qu now remember, Louise, these questions have been vetted. Oh, great. By you? Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Uh, what, what, Louise, oh, no. Uh, this, this uh, comes from uh, uh, Concerned in Kalispell. <laughs> <laughs> What, what is it like to live in a teepee? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear everybody up there in Shangri-La lives in a teepee. <laughs> they do now, actually. More, more they white really, people. they're big, they're big. More white people wouldn't. live in teepees than Indians. That's how, you know, that's how it works. They're, um, they're beautiful. They're okay, well, yeah. no, actually, we have, a, we, have a, we have some good questions here for you, so we'll, we'll uh, do we have more? I did, I did oh. live up there for a while. I, I really miss Montana. I, I love Montana. Oh, yeah. Oh. Montana. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of quotes. We'll be here till 11 tonight. I hope, I hope you have, I have, have a lot of water left up there. Um, let's, no, let's, I don't have enough. <laughs> let's start with this one. Uh, <clears throat> what has kept you motivated to keep writing in the face of adversities? How do you deal with uh, insecurities, as, any insecurities as a writer? Oh, well, you know, uh, I deal with them by writing. <laughs> I have a lot of insecurities. <laughs> I deal, I deal with, with, with uh, you know, mo most things of that nature really by writing. It's true. Mm. This is actually, oh, I'm sorry, am I? No. You, oh, okay. Uh, so... This is actually something that I tried to talk about with you in, uh, when I interviewed you for the Paris Review, oh, you and tried. you, you uh, didn't answer it. So somebody else, believe it or not, asked the same question. So this is your destiny. Writing Louise. process? Yeah. <laughs> yep. But, but no, no, no. But hold on. This is, <laughs> this is So we heard a little about your early writing process from yeah. Lois's introduction. What does that process look like now? How has it changed? From... Uh, early writing process to late writing process. Yeah. <laughs> what can you say? You're 68, you're still writing. It's the same. The same. It's the same, yeah. Nothing has changed. No, because you're <laughs> always writing an, another, I mean, now I know, as I just said, you know, I, I learned so much, I should, read history if I'm 
stuck. I should remember that uh, my ego is meaningless if stuck. I should remember that, what else, Lois? Yeah. <laughs> I, should, I should remember uh, that, uh, you know, I have, I have children and grandchildren, so um, that's, that's the most important thing, to, you know, in my, my mother, my family, my brothers and sisters. I mean, I have this, I, I, have, I have people, so, and, and it's true that I didn't really know that I had that kind of, I didn't know that I had other people in the beginning. It was hard, a lot harder. It still, it still isn't easy because then you're, um, it's the same, but it takes you longer to get to it. Like I used to start right away in the morning. I'd go for a run and then I'd write. I'd take the kids to school, then I'd write. And now, I kick back with a cup of coffee, and I, <laughs> I look at things, and I think, oh yeah, I'm a writer, I better get to it. It's the same. So if I hear you right, you're saying it's the same but different. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer, Louise, thank you. I'm tr I was trying to draw that answer out. <laughs> What was your what was your most difficult book to write and why? Well, uh, they're all really hard to write. You know, this isn't. It's not like it's easy uh, to write. It doesn't get easier. I guess that's what I mean. I don't even know which one I would say is the most difficult. Uh, it's the one I'm working on now. It's always the one you're working on now. You think that's never going to happen. I'm never going to write it. And there's a lot of uh, doubt and despair, <laughs> insecurity, all that comes it comes out. And um, uh, I'm really lucky to have my daughters because they remember that I'm going to mope around, going, "This is." Never, I'm done, it's over, nothing's ever going to happen. They go, oh yeah, you know, just stand back, mom, stand back. That's what you said the last time. And then, that really helps, because you can't believe it. I, I felt the way, that same way, you know. You just forget. So there wasn't one. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a good answer. And, uh, okay, next okay, question. Next. Also, just so you know, uh, Louise, you can call your lifeline if you need to. <laughs> I don't know who it is, but you have an option. Um, Thank you. So in your, uh, I, uh, in your intro to uh, Winter in the Blood, you noted that Welch had done something nobody else had done, uh, written about Indians without once getting pious, uplifting, or making you feel sorry for the plight. What do you mean by that, particularly the phrase, the plight? I think, I think that's a really important question for younger Native writers, because I think there's a, you know, there's a push to write about the plight. <laughs> is there? I don't, I think there is. Uh, is yeah. there? I mean, you, you're seeing a lot, of, I, I'm seeing this too, because of, uh, so this book is about a bookstore that has a lot of, it's about, it's about my bookstore, but you know, it's about a bookstore that's haunted by the ghost of, you know, you, it's a ghost. And um, yes, there is a lot about the plight going on, but uh, the plight kind of shifts, it's kind of, um, like that kind of silly putty you get. It's always a little different. And uh, I, I don't think you can, if you're gonna write, you're always gonna have it 
and the back of everything. I mean, you know, I had to talk about extermination. I had to talk about these, these things. Um, but he, man he manages to do that without making you feel some kind of pity because nobody wants pity, right? And that's something writers have to probably um, absorb. Nobody likes, nobody likes your, feels sorry for your writing and reads it, right? Nobody's gonna read it for, for that reason. So um, you can write about it in some way that doesn't make people feel sorry for you, right? Does that make sense? I mean, it does to me. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> does it mean you want me to feel feel sorry for you? I'm, I, is that, like, like that what you're saying? I couldn't quite hear. Like, do you want to feel? Uh, yeah, I, I do I feel. Guess. I feel for you. Okay. I feel for you. <laughs> Thank you. I really do. That was that was all I was looking for. Okay. Yeah, yeah I do. I do feel for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's do uh, let's do two more questions and we'll call it good, huh? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, audience. You're so patient. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, let's, here, we have one amazing question we're going to finish with, but we'll, we'll, okay. we'll get there. Amazing we'll, question is coming. Not, not yet. This f first. Oh. So-so <laughs> question is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. This, this one, I'm sorry, whoever asked this, this is a very mediocre question, but um, how, uh, how valuable or impactful has the kinship you have with other Native writers been in your career and life? It's, you know, it's been so important that uh, I had to start a bookstore so I would get people to come in, you know. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, it's, it's native, native writers are important to me, but actually all literature is deeply important to me, and I needed to have people around. I, that was one of the reasons. God knows it's a... It, it's a crazy, idiotic, it was mind-blowingly um, ignorant to start a bookstore out of all the reasons that we did. <laughs> because it's incredibly difficult. <laughs> and it, it soaks up tremendous amounts of time, but it's also the most, it's the best thing I've ever done, ex except for children and, you know. <laughs> but it's the best thing because I have, I do get to meet people and talk to people and talk about writing and talk about, you know, you, you, you do face certain projects in, 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 and difficulties and problems in common with other um, indigenous writers. And that's one of the stated reasons you have for putting together this festival so people can talk about those things. It's very important to have other, other people in your, your work to feel pity for each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the main, <clears throat> this isn't on the website, but one of the main reasons I wanted to start this is because I don't have any friends. And so uh, I, I What'd thought, you say, you don't have any friends? I don't have any friends, and so oh, I thought maybe the, this, Did everybody know. hear that way in the back? <laughs> He wants friends. So I was, I was like, I'll just make them hang out with me. I think your you know? dad's up here just <laughs> laughing. That's, well, he doesn't have any friends either, so it's... <laughs> well, so, you taught him well. <laughs> so, all right. Sterling, that is not the way to get friends. <laughs> well, I mean, some of us learn our lessons late, you know? Um, some, some learn it in you know, fifth grade, and some of us are in our 40s, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll finish on this one. All right, this, this um, is this, the question. This, this, this I know is it. For, uh, this I, is I'm it. not going to say who it is, but I know this comes from one of our volunteers. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I love your butter sex scene in Love Medicine. Hottest ever, exclamation point. Whoa. Yeah, hottest ever. All right, did you hear that? Loves yeah. the butter sex scene yep. in Love Medicine. Yep, and hottest ever is in, all in caps, and then the exclamation point is a heart underneath it instead of a dot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so, share anything about process of writing sex. <laughs> all right. 
I will share. No, um, James Welch taught me. <laughs> that you have to, you have to describe your work. You have to describe your experience. Even if you have a job that you may hate or a job you may love, you have to describe it and describe it. Um, I'm, wait a minute, I'm really not talking about this. Uh, wh what do you want me to say? What do you want? No, okay, you want me to tell you the secrets of writing a good sex scene. Okay, I'll tell you what it is. Um, it's not to talk about sex very much. It's not. You don't really talk about, you know, this was the pro one of the big problems, I, one of the many problems, but you remember John Updike, right? Wr wrote the worst sex scenes in the world, thinking that they were wonderful because he described every detail, every detail, every ooh, physical detail. <laughs> you don't want to know that. What you want to know is butter was involved. Not just, not just any butter, but, and this was true, um, sometimes the U.S. government would send up semi-truckloads of uh, surplus butter, and sometimes it was not commodity butter. It was real butter. It was fresh dairy butter. That was why it was sexy. Yeah. In addition to that, <laughs> so it, it really is. So I, I seriously have a couple more hints. Describe, um, so uh, I, I uh, stole this from the writer Colette, who write, writes the best sex scenes in the world. Um, don't describe what's happening, lead up to it, and describe the, let's say you're going into a bedroom or something, okay. What she'll describe is the, the lamps, the kind of light they're casting. She'll describe the base of the lamp. She'll describe the lamp shade. She'll make that whole room so drenched with sex that it doesn't even matter what they do. <laughs> and that's what you do. So, if there's a secret, that's it. Butter. Thank you.